Yes, hello there and uh, welcome. It's uh, December 10th and this is the ORI FPGA meetup. Uh, and we talk about all sorts of FPGA stuff and wow, have we been busy on um, on Opulent Voice and a little bit of activity on the, the receive side on the, the spacecraft. Um, but what we do is we talk about what we've done over the past week, what we have, play, have, play, have, play, have. And if we need any resources or if we um, you know, have any, any roadblocks, um, and so I will uh, hand it over to uh, anyone that has to, to leave early, um, 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 uh, take off early, then uh, please uh, take take it away, Aaron. Sure. Um, so since last time, let me bring on my notes. Um, I did some testing with the Pluto MSK firmware. Um, there was a period of time where the OpenCPI version running on it uh, started uh, no longer working. Um, I think it might be related to a, a DMA kernel that got added sometime. I think last time the one I've been running with is from July, so it's been it's been a while. Um, but uh, what happens is that uh, for some for whatever reason, when I load the OpenCPI kernel driver, it uh, crashes the whole system. So uh, that's more of like a watch item that I've been um, trying to hone down to see exactly what where that problem started occurring. Um, working on the software implementation of the MSK transmitter, I, I felt like I was pretty close um, and that I can PC connected. continue one. working on that. Um, so what I did and to debug why it wasn't working with RF loopback, I removed the PRBS generator um, oh, and the shit. synchronization from the application to be able to debu debug using burst of data versus continuous data. So I created a simple packet uh, that contains zeros and ones. Um, some random zeros so that I can validate the mod and dmod is still working. Uh, and I've been able to validate that. And the next thing I did was to separate the transmit from the receive such that I can uh, isolate exactly where, it, where the problem is occurring. And I've done that so I have a, I could transmit to a file um, to go in from CPU to FPGA and then back to file, um, the IQ data, and then the, the same thing, you can use that file and feed it back into the decimator and the demodulator, and that works. Um, it can validate that the burst, the burst of data is, is still valid. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. So the next thing I'm gonna do is gonna add the 809363 into the loop, into digital loopback. So transmit um, the zeros and one um, packet of data, go through the FPGA, uh, go to the transceiver, um, and then come back uh, and, and capture that to a file and then play that back against the demodulated um, receive portion of the application um, and see if that works uh, to try to hone in or where um, I can't do that in real time by uh, doing it offline. Um, and that's that's where I'm at. Um, and I'll continue working on that um, and try to get that in a working state. That's an awesome amount of progress. Uh, thanks for the report. Mm -hmm. Be happy if we were making progress that fast. <laughs> Matthew, you want to take the floor? Sure. Yeah, I don't have a lot in terms of um, updates uh, in regards to uh, uh, the MSK modem itself. I've kind of gotten sidetracked with uh, real work and the... Um, ILAs kind of is a little stagnant. I, I think I'm still on track for getting the ILAs working. I think my problem last time was that that it was putting in two ILAs when I only needed one because I the bit widths were too wide, so it needed a second ILA to cover the number of bits I was trying to trace. So I think that was putting us over the the LUT capacity of the FPGA. So if I even just it was one bit over, so if I take out the one bit, I'm hoping we only generate one ILA. And then that would be within the LUT capacity of the device. Um, if not, then then you know we'd have to take out something else or just uh, um, give up on the ILA approach at least for for this device. Um, but I don't think even if we had to, all is lost. If we could, um, you know, get the receive streaming working, we could use that as a diagnostic channel. And there's you know would be a lot of data that we could get out of um, the modem in in the uh, AXI streaming interface back to the to the DMA to memory. Um, then the the other thing I've been working on is I keep promising a, a power detector 
So I started that last night, starting with a exponential moving average module that we can, you know, would be a separate module that we can include in in the uh, in our library, and then uh, that'll be included into the power uh, monitor. Uh, so the idea there is just, you know, the power measurements are going to be pretty noisy. So if we have an exponential moving average, we'd be able to um, get get a, a little bit more less noisy uh, power uh, value when we read it back. And then, um, so along with that, uh, you know, I squared plus Q squared uh, values that we would calculate. So even though the modem is a real, uh, uses a real signal, we still get the I, I samples and Q samples. So my plan would just be to implement an I squared plus Q squared and then, uh, and then filter that. And then um, we would be able to read that back. And then since uh, a square root isn't really handy in the library, <laughs> For hardware implementation, um, the software we, I think can handle doing the square root uh, to get the final power. And then the power is not going to be in DBM; it'll be DBFS for 16 bits, right? So, um, uh, well, I think the samples are 14 or 12 bits. Well, whatever the sample width is, um, you know, the DB, it'll be in DBFS, DB full scale. Um, you know, uh, well, I guess it won't be in that. We'll have to, we can compute DB full scale. We can compute DBM if we look back and through the entire signal chain, understand gains and attenuations and whatnot. You know, we could, we'd be able to compute all of those and then you know apply them to the value we read to get a DBM value if we if we wanted to do that. But at least um, the value would give us a relative understanding of of what's uh, coming in to the digital section. So it'd be a good start. And I think I think that's all I had. Um, for this week. Cool. Who's next? Uh, either me or you. Go ahead. Show the graphs. <laughs> okay. We, we've been having fun with making graphs of experiments, even though sometimes the experiments are, are more puzzling than enlightening. Uh, the latest graph just came out a few minutes before, actually a minute before the meeting start, started. So you probably haven't seen it yet. There's a, this is a, a graph, two, two pair of graphs, one made on the loopback side, one made on the separate receiver side of roughly the same simultaneous experiment. Um, and now we've turned up the, the amplitude in the hopes that that might actually be better. Um, it seemed like for a while that turning it up made things worse, but um, I now believe that might've been a mistake because uh, the signal we were feeding it for many of these tests was been pretty weak, uh, which means we're probably mostly demodulating the leakage. Um, that's my guess anyway. And then turning turning the signal uh, down. Yeah, anyway, I'm not sure what, what's going on with that. But once we get a, a real measurement of what the signal is inside the modem, I'll be a lot more confident in, in explaining what's going on. Anyway, let's see if I can... Uh, share my screen successfully yeah, you be. um and then i gotta figure out which one of these silly windows is the one i want um let's start with this one yeah yeah this is what it looks like um in loopback so take a look at that third graph from the top the one that's labeled bit errors zoom too it's got that big fat black bar around 50,000 and the red is stuck at zero. That's a perfect result. Zero uh, bit error rate for the whole duration of the test. Uh, you can see if you look on the higher graphs that it's not actually perfect all the time. It's just perfect a lot of the time. There are some, um, some spurious bit counts sneaking in there every now and then, uh, but it's, it's really good a lot of the time and it recovers when it gets off. Um, the accumulators are well behaved, uh, sticking less than 10,000 plus or minus uh, for the whole test. Uh, that top one that's mar just marked accumes is, is auto scaled. So it never gets above the range that you see graphed here, which is like plus 40,000 to minus 10,000 or so. 
And if you look at the uh, the telemetry, the NCO adjusts and the, the frequency errors, they look uh, reasonably well behaved. The numbers are small and they don't, there's not, not, not lots of big excursions. And anyway, this is what I think a radio, a happy radio mostly looks like. Uh, not a hundred percent perfect, but definitely happy in the way we've, you know, yeah, this was really nice. Before. Now <laughs> I'm going to share what it looks like when, uh, when we're receiving on the separate flute. Uh, so this is RF loop back. Yes. Yes. This is RF loop back. That didn't work. Uh, let me try again. Double clicking on the graph you want probably apparently doesn't work. I have to push the share button. Okay. That worked. It's just that I've got a window in the way. All right. How about that? Now we're looking at the uh, re separate receiver. And if you look at the top, you can see that it's it's spending most of its time confused and it only gets a chance to try again every when it, when the bit count rolls over, uh, which has only happened uh, th three times on this graph, or no, four times, just barely four times. Um, things are worked for the first few hundred data points we had 50% uh, error rate but we had the bit count in the plausible range uh, the accumulators look good and the accumulators are doing their thing more or less um they're you know they're not very big values and they're they're centered around zero and then something goes wrong <laughs> and uh, the f1 accumulator starts to look like a murmuration of starlings uh, <laughs> flying away from zero all the way up to two times 10 to the eight while the the f2 accumulator stays pegged at zero uh, this is a live copy of the graph so i can actually float my cursor over uh, you can see that it's, the it's, is zero. it looks like it's railing as you get to the right because it's like flat on top versus noisy underneath uh, 2.3 times 10 to the eighth yeah that might be railed yeah. And the NCO adjusts meanwhile, and the F frequency errors are flatlined until near the very end here. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, something weird happened because it got a not a number. And it, yeah, it finally failed with a not a number. So, whatever the heck that is. Um, so, these are the puzzles that we're trying to figure out. And so, the, you know, it's a couple of comments. One is the 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 frequency error or the frequency error. So this is okay. This is the error signal coming in, but it's it's near zero, and the adjust is near zero. If this accumulator is way off, the NCO adjust should, for at least for the um for the corresponding loop, should be high. Right. I mean, it's like the eye gain is zero. I I mean, it's I assume it's not because I see it at the top, but that's just really interesting that that. We're not dragging the, 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 it's like the NCO is not moving, like that's frozen. Right. Yes, it does appear and, that. And the error signal's not, the error signal even, even before the NCO. Mm. It, so to say the NCO is adjusted, that, it, but the adjust value, unless we zero it, I mean, the, the um, error signal should be way off to be accumulating that much um, to, to be accumulating that much. That's just, there, there's an inconsistency here that's really interesting. In... Yeah, I think everything's the same size. I tried to track it down. Can you all hear Michelle okay when she's talking? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, okay, but the, so say like the FX errors when the NCO adjusts, we're not just seeing one of the two, right? The, the, you have the green and the blue are overlaid on each other on those two. Or all three yeah. of the bottom ones. That's right. Yeah. It turns to orange and blue, I think, for the telemetry. Because because you can't see the green in the in the in the accumulator zoom, right? Because it's out of scale. That's right. So I'm just saying so the NCO adjust and the FX errors, we don't it's not out of scale or the is the are these auto scaled? These are not quite auto scaled. I narrowed them in a little bit, but only 
Uh, so you can see most of the points. There's only a few points that are further out than the graph. But it looks like there might be some orange points in there still, I guess, if it's orange. Um, yeah, like there's a point here that's minus 619. There might have been a couple of points that were a little further out from 1,000, but not very many. I can I can change that here on the fly since we're looking at live graphs if you want me to. Yeah, I mean, just I'm curious if, if we're just missing something here in the plot. Okay, I'm just going to turn off the the uh, range restriction on the telemetry. Um, that would be deleting this. That should make it redraw. Yeah. Okay, so that you can see out mostly toward the right, there are some big values in the frequency error. And then yeah. NCO adjusts, I'll delete that. So there's just one data point hanging out here. Yeah, but it's not doing the same thing that the accumulator's doing, so. No. It's like the accumulator's not at or you know Im impacting the NCO adjustment like you would expect. And you don't have an error to be accumulated, right? The, the errors right. Are, are zero, so how are we accumulating this this really large value in the uh, in one of the loops? So I mean it looks like it's just one of the loops that has this off. Yeah, it seems to always be F1 that takes off like this. I mean, we you know, I mean, it's it's anecdotes are not really proof, but every time that this happens on the receiver, it seems like F1 takes off, F2 goes to zero. And it's weird because I can't I can't see where that can really happen. So if we could figure this out, it might be a big clue. Um, it's definitely weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I think you're right, Paul. We should see if we can get a if we could get a power reading so we can see the relative power between the RF loop back and the um over the air. That might be interesting. Yeah, we've been really conservative with the like the loop backs and, and putting um transmitter power into receivers. I and we've been very conservative. So the signals are never really booming. Yeah. Just because we don't want to blow out the radios that we have. Um, right. <laughs> if, if we could get like, if we could get an indication that it, it would make our paranoid minds relieved. Yeah. Right now we're on the safety limit. I've still got a 10 dB attenuator right at the output of the transmitter. That serves two purposes. One is that it can never transmit it to an open. And the other is that with 10 dB of attenuation, it's not loud enough to blow out its own receiver, according to the specs. Um, so are we cabled from the TX to the RX on the on the loopback side or on the on the uh, Pluto that's looping back to itself or are they both over the air? They're through a cable. Okay. Both oh, and then to the other receivers to a cable also. Yes. Okay, so it's actually not on the it's air. The same cable. It comes out of the transmitter, goes into a splitter. That so you would expect the same power into both modems. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Like, well, if you had no leakage, you'd expect the same power into both modems. Right. The yeah, so the clocks on the, the Pluto SDR are pretty bad. So even though you set it to the same frequency, I don't know if the carrier offset would be such beyond the capabilities of the of the receiver side. To kind of depends on the loop bandwidth. For... Yeah. yeah. Have, have you updated these uh, They're Plutos like... with the TCXOs? <laughs> I do not have any Plutos with TCXOs here. I have calibrated the ones we have, so they're not as far off as they are from the factory. Oh, okay. Yeah, that helps. And we also have the, a large loop bandwidth. We're we're out at the 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 you know in in terms of like what range do you want for a loop bandwidth? We're at I think we are at the target frequency divided by twenty. Yeah, and I, I think we, back in the Slack channel at some point, we computed the potential offset between the two Pluto LOs with uh, looking at the tolerance of the of the actual parts. And I think it was just like 20 or 30 hertz um, frequency offset at the, at the frequencies we're using. Yeah, we should be able to handle it. Um, but um, he's right. Uh, the, the clocks are not great. Yeah. 
I think, yeah, the drifting could be a bigger, would be, might be the bigger issue if we're not tracking it. Um, but, it, you know, over these short times, I wouldn't expect it to drift that much. Yeah, and they've been on for like, I don't know, at this point, weeks. So <laughs> it it shouldn't be thermal because they're they're usually warm. Yeah, the yeah. remote lab is its own little crystal oven because it uh, has enough extra uh, appliances running and using power that it stays warmer than the rest of the house. Right. <laughs> so it's an OCXO in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and well, an open. <laughs> it's a yeah. And I don't know. Oh, it's really interesting that it, this is. Uh, I, I don't even have any any ideas of what 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 would be happening here. I, I mean, it, it, you know, because most especially to be accumulating that much error, we should be seeing errors into the into the PI controller, and we're not seeing uh, uh, errors into the PI controller of any notable amount that should push the accumulator off that far right yeah that was the first thing that popped out at me it, when we added the telemetry in which was a really really good good idea it's been helpful um and i was just expecting to see like it's acting normal and there would be some other problem but it it is uh it's surprising i i i don't i don't mistrust the these registers i think they're you know they're i looked and they're, they're like they're reporting the, the actual numbers so maybe it's yeah, and then the loopback case they looked reasonable. I mean, they you wouldn't expect them to be zero, but they should be within a constrained range with a mean zero, right? And so that's what we're seeing in the loopback case. Very much, yeah. The loopback, especially the RF loopback, is behaving really well. So when it, I mean, when I when we when we pulled it apart and and set up the the over the air test and it didn't work, I was really kind of taken aback because it seems like. Um, it, it, we should see something. Um, I mean, there's, there's, so, so we, we do need to dig in and figure out what the, what the problem is. I, and I did at least one thorough pass. The only change that we are doing is to, to set up the radio a little differently for, um, for RX active. So it's a receiver active means that the push to talk is off and the, and the, um, the loop back is off. And that's it. That's the only difference between the RF loopback test and the RX active test. The rest of the code. Well, the loopback should be off in the in the in the loopback test as well, right? For RF, yeah, for RF. That's right. Sorry. The and the RF loopback. I think it's just push to talk is active, and the loopback's off. Yeah. 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 Right. That's correct. That's the only difference. And when and I report the MSK control register, and it that's that's what it's doing. So there could still be something wrong with the processor side or the application code. I haven't found it yet, but I cycle back through and review it compulsively. So yeah. I, I haven't found so, it yet. I, I don't know what's gone wrong, um, but it is the same and the same firmware on both Pluto's. Um, in this test, there's not much opportunity for the application code to, to interfere because it's mostly staying out of the way. True. Yeah, I'm trying to do less and less on the application side. Yeah. Well, so the the power monitor could be could really be helpful. I mean, so we'd expect the power values from both modems to be the same. If yeah. the, if they weren't, then yeah, maybe it, you know the, the leakage could be dominating, and in the loopback one is blocking to leakage potentially. Yeah, I, I'd be kind of surprised about that, but it it does sort of pop up as a hypothesis here, but based on yeah. the, what we're seeing, I I don't I, I, yeah. So yeah, the 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 power, you know, getting the you know telling it the radio reporting here's here's the received power would sell yeah. that. I, I've seen the, QPSK the modems lock in the lab with, with just on leakage. They, they're not connected to anything, right? It's, they're they're locking and working nicely, so it, it, it's real. Yeah, it really yeah. happens. Yeah, I was the, hoping the, it was like I was hoping that was an outside explanation, but it. I I, I think your experience speaks volumes here. <laughs> I, I well, I mean, so the power detectors would probably tell us, right? Because again, the, the powers should be the same in both modems, but if they're right. If it's, if it's higher and say the loopback, then that would be a clue that would kind of 
support the leakage theory. It, but, you, know, you wouldn't expect leakage to be that high. You'd expect the 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 power, the direct power from the from the cable to to be higher, right? Unless yeah. unless there's something misconfigured in the receive chain, um, such that you know the leakage is dominating and. You know, so I mean, I guess that there could, you know, there could maybe still be something in the receive chain that's, um, yeah, that's not possible. ideal, right? Right. If we can't see the the power change when we change the input power, then we'll know something's wrong in the receive chain. Yeah, and most of the difference between, like, if we get a a power a received power estimate, then not all of it, but most of it. Um, you know, we can then say, oh, this is, we can now quantify the leakage in a, in a system, you know. And yeah, you, you could even, say, you like, could even. Separated by so much space in the lab, we can actually then say, this is your path loss, <laughs> you know, for, for leakage is actually affecting the other receiver, you know, it'll be a, it'll be a, a small amount, a very small amount, but. but not there's, there's two things we can do to, to test for this, right? One would be, um, if, once we have the power monitor, you could. Uh, you could you could uh, transmit into a 50 ohm load, right? And then see if the modem, well, we could do this even without the uh, power monitor. Just put a 50 ohm load on the output and run it the same way you're running it now and see if the receiver locks. Oh yeah, that's that's a good test. So that would tell you if, we, yeah. if we're locking a leakage without, you know, with, at, you know, completely, right? And then the other thing then would be um, you know, we could effectively measure that leakage if we have the power monitor. If you did the same thing, you could you could see how much power is coming back into the modem uh, due to leakage, right? Yeah, that's um, a good idea. I think we'll do that. We haven't done that recently. We had we did it and back in uh, we we're set up in DC, Vancouver, or Vancouver yeah, where we were. Yeah, I don't remember we could also happened. try stacking the two Plutos on top of each other to see if we can get the leakage to get, <laughs> to get across. To yeah. the... That's good. Okay, now that's, that's something to try. We'll do that. Yeah, and so I, like I said, I have the I, I'm moving forward with the with the um, power detector. I uh, just had started with the averaging circuit, so that's the code's done, but there's it's not computing the average quite right. So I'm just tweaking the math and the bit widths and that sort of thing. So once that's done, then, um, you know, I can put together the I squared plus Q squared. That's a pretty simple circuit. Um, oh, then the other thing is that whatever power we compute from that will be 3 dB high because we're only using the the I channel um, for, the, for the demodulation. So the power will be higher than what the modem's actually receiving by 3 dB. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, as long as you're just computing on the I channel, you might as well just get report power on the I channel too. Yeah, I was it wasn't as clear to me how to do that. I mean, you could do a root mean square, but then we just have to collect a bunch of data, right, and then uh, square it and average it. Um, yeah, we could do that too. We could do both, and we should see like a three dB difference, right? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I can square the I channel. And average it, and then report that in its own register, such that, and again, uh, trying to think if we could do an a, a exponential moving average on that, and just then square root it, it probably would get you close to what the I power is, and should be yeah half, cool. half the Q, I squared plus Q squared power. Okay, no, that sounds that sounds like a good start. Yeah, I mean that would be interesting. Yeah, to do it both ways and see see what the um, how they compare. Does <laughs> all I really care about? I want to see like the most most significant bit wiggle. Yeah. So, <laughs> I want it should be within the top three dB or so of the uh, of the range. I don't care what the absolute dBm are or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, so typically you want to load your ADC, right, such that it, I mean, you need to, um, well, I'm used to kind of quam waveforms, so they can be spinning at the receiver. So you have to add 3 dB back off for the spinning and maybe in our 3 dB for noise. Here, we, we shouldn't be spinning. So 
we 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 can and noise isn't really as much of an issue in terms of of, of uh, magnitude, right? Um, like it would be in a QAM receiver. So yeah, <laughs> you could probably do pretty much close to full scale input uh, power. I think the 9363 is an AGC circuit, right? So is that engaged? Have we configured that? Um, no, not, not on purpose. I, okay. I didn't know it had one. Yeah. No, it has AGC in there. You can, you can, you can get that. But no, we haven't, we haven't employed any, anything on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so, I mean, we, you know, this is all really interesting, but I mean, at some point, you know, to get a really stable system, we'll have to kind of dig through that receive signal chain and, and make sure it's all configured uh, nicely. And we probably would, you know, we may, well, we'd likely want to use AGC if it's available and yes. uh, to, to keep the power consistent into the, into the demodulator. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. That'll, that'll, that'll be interesting um, to, to get that all set up and, and working since there's a lot available in the 9363. Do you know if the device has any kind of feedback on the AGC? Can I get an RSSI out of it? I, I think you can. I, you know, I, I can't say, uh, I haven't looked at it that close, but you know, it, that would make sense that they would do that. You should be able to. I, think I, I Let me put it another way. I'd be really surprised if they didn't, that would be a big, you know, for everything that's in the chip, if you couldn't get an RSSI or at least some indication of the AGC uh, value out, that would be a big miss. Yeah, just just from memory, from reading back over like engineer zone posts, I think it exists because they were advising the university in the in the university section, the, their educational support. They they brought this up, so I, I think that exists. Yeah, it, it must. I mean, like I said, it would be really disappointing if it didn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because because then you have to put a power monitor on the board, right? I mean, it, it's already there. Yeah. <laughs> so they they would it has to be it would just be mind-boggling if it wasn't yeah well yeah it never even occurred to me that that would be true but I, you're absolutely right and i should have been reading the manual instead of nagging you for a power monitor <laughs> well we still even if it you know even still you know we don't know that the signal chain values are set you know optimally right so it's still useful to have the power monitor in the modem um because you, you don't know what's getting to the modem, even if you know what's getting into the, you know, the RF front end, right? True. Yeah, this will be good. But I mean, yeah, this is this is you know typical modem development stuff, right? You you, you get the modem working, and then you start putting all the stuff around it, and, and having to optimize it, and and you know you know develop a signal chain. So, I mean. Like we should, you know, at some point specify, at least, you know, for the Pluto, other platforms would be different what the, you know, input power ranges in DBM and what the output power, uh, you know, is expected to be in DBM. And and then, you know, you'd work through the signal chain and make sure all the gains and are set, you know, appropriately so that you get an ideal signal level into the demodulator. Um, you know, because that, all that is, you know, that all has to be done so you can optimize your system threshold and system gain and, um yeah, you know, and yeah, so it gives you the best, uh, you know, uh, threshold level or uh, right. yeah, receiver true. sensitivity, right? All that stuff has to be right to get the receiver sensitivity to be uh, at its best point. Yeah, I think, and that's where your your approach um, for for using parameterized and and the sort of the modular approach uh, and making it more general at at every opportunity. I think that's where it will really shine. Is is uh, you know, being able to, um, you know, branch out and adapt to to the other platforms that we might be interested in, you know, even just yeah. here. I think that's where it will really uh, pay off because uh, I know it's a lot of extra effort to to make it general and, you know, modular and <laughs> parameterized. Yeah. Put all that stuff in. <laughs> I think that's, that's where it really starts to show up because otherwise you have to rip up a lot of code. And then every time that you change like a hard-coded value or assumption it is dangerous it right impressive. so and we've got yeah. you know that so if you look at the code you go wow this is you know there's lots of generalizations here there's lots of extra bit widths and things like that this is this is on purpose it really will help us when we when we want to to adapt this or if somebody else wants to take it on and adapt it so i, I think that's good yeah. good stuff 
it's kind of in my DNA. I, I, I don't think I could write code with, without that, you know, for all the years that, I mean, it, it serves really well. I mean, you know, in, in my day job, you know, we could take our modem and respin it to a new customer's requirements, you know, in, in a few weeks. And, and it's all because of the modularity that we've, you know, put into this modem for the last two decades. Right. Um, so it, it is, it makes, you know, everything, um, uh, agile if you will to a, to a degree you can take that and reuse it um and you know with, with very little rtl change if any um yeah the i think the bit widths aren't necessarily optimized in in the design right now and that could you know stand some more system analysis there might be some you know i mean we have lots we're carrying lots of bits and we might be carrying more than we need uh in a lot of cases but um yeah, you know, so it, it consumes some resources. Maybe you know, if we if we optimize those, we we use less resources. But on the other hand, you know, if we're not overfilling, then then you can carry them. Um, right, but until we know like exactly which ones are over are truly overfilled or over allocated, you know, so it's it's just yeah. the right answer. We I think I think this is the right path, and the optimization is going to have to come a little bit later. Like when we get our hands really on uh, some of these questions and, and, and the things that we've, that we don't yet have a, uh, you know, have under our fingers when they become a lot more, uh, get a grip on it, then, then I think we'll be able to optimize uh, a lot of, of the, the bits out. Um, but the design really needs to be like published and presented with, with the flexibility and the generalization in there. And right, I, you would never. You, I don't think you'd ever change the code. I mean, you'd likely you just change the the, the generics for for the right. particular implementation that uh, and that and the requirements for that implementation. Right. Right. So that, that was kind of the idea is that that it's you know flexible in that way. They're, yeah. They're, uh, you hit it perfectly. I think it's it's going to work. If there's anything that we need to like expand, I, I don't know if there is, but like you know, like when we're going walking through the PI games and they just keep getting smaller. You know, and I'm like, oh wow, that 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 isn't even really representable with the with the register that we have. So you know, we'll figure it out. We'll keep, keep working at it. But you know, there's yeah. there's things that we may need to 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 accommodate. Um, you know, or or that's a sign that we need to back up and and change something else. Yeah, I mean, you know, for instance, I was thinking, uh, you know, we could get the gains larger if we get the the accumulator gain or the um, you know, the phase detector gain down. Um, yeah. And, and we can do that in a couple of ways, just, you know, increasing that, that, uh, the discard ratio, um, to get the effective sample area down. I picked two and a half cause it was fairly safe. Cause now you're creating Nyquist at, um, like one and a quarter. And I think the, um, originally the F2 was like 433, I think. So yeah. it was, it was close enough that, you know, that gave a little bit of headroom, but you know, we, we could bring the F1, the FC down quite a bit, right? It doesn't have to be 32 times uh, the bit rate. It could be, you know, 10 times the bit rate. And then if we do that, we can bring the, uh, we can increase the discard ratio further. Um, and so then we'd have, you know, that the that would bring the uh, phase detector gain down as well, which would probably, I think, help with the PI gains. Um, and then at some point we need a proper uh, decimator in in the receive path instead of the the discarding. Okay. Yeah, so. I can. I'll I'll take a look and see with with the with the with the, uh, the MATLAB that we we have right now. So the model that we have right now, I can because I haven't changed. I haven't experimented with changing the that carrier frequency or the IF frequency at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I can. I can and then we, we and we do we do have the the uh, decimator in the receive chain, right? I don't I just don't think it's enabled right now, so that could be enabled, um, and then we wouldn't need. Uh, I mean, we still have to compute everything with the discard ratio. We need to know what it is, but it would, um, yeah, we we wouldn't have to program that discard ratio. It would be data would be coming in at the lower rate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, there's lots of things to do here and, and experiment and play with, um, you know, so it, it should keep us busy for a while. But I, I mean, the, the progress we've had so far, I mean, it, it was really a struggle for for some weeks there, but seeing the uh, 
RF loopback working is just really exciting. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good deal. And it seems pretty pretty reliable. Uh, we've we've started and restarted and and uh, you know we'll we'll keep at it. We'll keep poking at it to see where it breaks down and and that's yeah. good information back. You know what what happens when you abuse it is uh, is important. Um, you know yeah we'll keep at it and we'll we'll just keep uh, keep at it until it works really well. Yeah, and those gains that you saw in the Python script, they're not necessarily, they're not, I'm sure they're not optimized. They just were a set of gains that I kind of estimated and, and based on your work, and and they seem to work, at least in simulation and now in the RF loopback. So I'm sure, um, yeah, they could be made better. Um, yeah, I mean, the, well, the one comment I have about, you know, the, the way we're doing the gains right now to represent the really small numbers is that... Um, when you do the shift right, if we make, if we make, you know, we want to kind of minimize the, the right shifting, right. Or the divisor, because um, we, we, lo we lose resolution, right. In that it, it, if you say the, the gain value for P is 580 and say the error signal was 10, you know, then it's 508, 5,800, but then we right shift by, by um, 14 or no, 12, uh, 96 if we 15 so say we right shift by 15 that that error or the the um that multiply value goes to zero right because we shift all the data out so now the error signal has to be large enough for us to actually uh get something usable out of that multiplier or right, right. Yeah. so i mean there's there's just a limitation of resolution there that could be hurting us as well um so again if we can get those pi gains larger than that then that helps us keep more resolution right all right well yeah we'll, we'll keep at it and uh and we'll figure it out I, there's some it's it's coming it every time that we sit down and work really hard on it more comes into focus and more you know gets under our fingers so um, yeah you know, and yeah those, what i what i've been trying to do is try to duplicate those the games that work and try to just by them in the theory with all of the updates that we've made um and that that not happening uh has really bothered me so i'm just going to keep at it until we've got a good understanding of what we're actually doing and uh and then yeah but my but the gains i'm using shouldn't be like if if they're not coming out i mean if they're within an order of magnitude i think you know that that would be make me happy right yeah <laughs> yeah i don't think you're going to get those numbers necessarily i just ended up with an estimate that worked right um right. so you know if, if you know i guess the other test would be run it with with other game values you're, you're computing and seeing if we get stable operation yeah we don't we it's 50 percent okay. numbers so something's wrong interesting with yeah the calculation so i'm going to ask for more help and kind of like try to draw in some people that that have uh even more book learning um and see what they say and then also yeah. to people with some more practical knowledge to see what they say too. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I've been, you know, I spent a lot of years in the lab working with these things, but I, I'm not, I was never really the systems engineer. I'm more, uh, you know, systems architect, but I, I've never really, it, it's not my forte to go do all the systems analysis, um, but it's really interesting. I'd like, I'm, you know, I, this is a nice project to get more hands on on that, but um yeah, having people that are more knowledgeable will certainly serve us well. Yeah, I think it will. I, I'm, I'm confident of the numbers in math land, you know, in pretend analog math land. But when, when we when we want to express them for the system that we have, then like I think you said on Slack, you know, it's it's uh, it's whenever you deal with a fixed point, you know, you really have to be careful with how you represent the numbers. So the underlying understanding, yeah, we agree. And then expressing them properly and documenting it in in the way that we're deploying it, that we're implementing it, the numbering systems that we're choosing along the way can make for huge differences in the values. And yeah. I think that's probably what's going on here. And I know I've got some of it right, and I've, I've got question marks on some. And based on the... The experiences that we've had in moving from the RF loop back on one device to uh, over the air test from a device to another device and it not working at all, this is a, a big red flag that 
something about the and the fact that the numbers that you have work they're much larger pi gains that's a big big clue so there's some sort of um i'm off by order uh, order of magnitude somewhere in the matlab and i'm going to try uh, my very best to track that down and and get a, an accurate model of what we're doing mm -hmm. now, blindly searching for pi gains is really wow it is not the best way to do it and you know, we've done a little bit. Yeah. That's what the code There's is. some heuristic algorithms that I've run across that seem to be, you know, regarded in industry, but I, then I found some other papers that say, well, they're just kind of panaceas. But like <laughs> one of the things to do, uh, there was it was named after a couple of guys I can't remember offhand. I'm sorry that you 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 zero the I gain and you keep increasing the P gain until you get a constant oscillation. Uh, constant magnitude oscillation and and frequency, so you get kind of a stable oscillation of the loop, and then right. you then you compute some percentage of that is the p gain and some other percentage is the i gain, and then right. you know that, that exactly so, what you're talking about because I used it in simulate for the simulate model to get the i gain <laughs> the pi the, the to get the uh, uh, pi gains there uh, to work uh, in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. and not are not anywhere close to what we have found so far for the uh for the implementation in Pluto. Um but yeah you're you're exactly right. It's it's considered to be kind of a crude way to do it, but it works. So right. yeah that that we'll add it to the list. But I, I mean I really I like the analysis. I, I think um yeah that's what I was trying to have uh I was hoping um uh Jeremy would be help us out on and he got busy. He got I I had a, a, a DM with him over the last couple of weeks, and he says he's just been really busy, but he's hoping to get back and and help out. So, um, yeah, he had, I think, he had a similar question about the KD about the. Uh, so I remember this came up. So so he he also struggled with how to define the gain for the essentially the uh, for KD, which would be the uh, I think that's what we're calling the uh, phase error detector gain, and how to right. do I properly represent it and, mm -hmm. and now i'm like oh yeah now now i have i have sympathy and empathy now because it is a struggle to properly uh define it and yeah and he noted with the really high sample rate you know that's one of the reasons we put i put in the sample discard is to bring that effective sample rate down um because he, he was noting at the you know at the 61.44 megahertz that that it was really hard to um, get a set of gains that, that made sense that, um, at that high of a sample rate. Um, right. so, I mean, I think that these are all consistent and we're, you know, look, learning a lot about how these, how to approach this, uh, kind of design from a systems analysis point of view. Heck yeah, this is great. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident we'll, we'll get there. It's, a uh, definitely a learning curve. Yeah, but I mean, I just look at what we've done already. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if I, I said this, but, you know, in over the years, like in the company I was working for, you know, we had a fairly small design team, but, you know, like with 20 engineers, we we built a, a product that was a multi-million dollar product. And, you know, you don't see big companies able to do that. And, um, and so you get the right group of people that, you know, that work well together. You can do some amazing things, even with a small a small group. And I, I feel like we're getting that here, you know, with the MSK modem, where, you know, we don't necessarily, we haven't, you know, hired a PhD in, in, you know, com theory, right. But we're still able to, to work through it and, and get the same results and we'll have something really good when we get to the end. Right on. Groovy. Okay. Well, I think we have plenty of action items. Um, any, any last, uh, last thoughts or comments before we close? And get back to work. Can't think of anything else. Nothing for me. Okay. Yeah, I think we, there's a little. There was a little bit of progress over on the receive side for the uh, for the multi rate receiver, uh, which is where all of our cool signals will will be sent. Um, but I, I I don't know enough about uh, what I was told to to properly pass it along. So I will. Uh, 
uh, we'll have to defer another week on that. But there has been some some progress. It sounds like some of the uh, problems, and these are problems not with the math because that's actually that actually went really well uh, with Theseus cores and the multi rate uh, processor. But the the main impediment has been uh, tool tool chains uh, and mm -hmm. the uh, no OS version to compile and work on our. Uh, dev board so there seemed to be a small breakthrough there so hopefully next week we'll we'll hear a little bit more about that and that's all i got i guess we will we'll still be in town next week the week after that will be christmas eve yeah we'll think we'll break for that <laughs> and maybe new year's eve after the week after that so. might be traveling for fcc i leave on the 17th so leave on 18th I think. oh okay Oh, you're right, 17th. Okay, so yeah, we'll be off for the next two weeks. But we'll be on Slack. Yeah, we'll actually be in the air during the meeting. Yeah. So we won't be here next week. <laughs> off to D.C. It'll be fun. Plenty to talk about from that, too. All right. So yeah, I think we'll probably reconvene in, in January. I'll I'll write up a, a notice and, and, and spread the word. We'll be on Slack. Absolutely. Maybe yep. Lab. It'll be a good end of year, New Year's uh, thing to get the lab cleaned up and and uh, rehabilitated for another another year of work. All righty. Great. Good. Thank right. you. I'll see you in person. Happy, happy happy holidays. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Happy holidays. Thank you. Yeah, I think in person meeting would be great. I look forward to that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. All right. Signing off from here. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.